It is the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. And it's another case of too many seabirds are never enough. And today I'm talking to one of the organisers of WSC3 just to continue the push to get you to understand and love seabirds a little bit more. But this guy's been my Twitter buddy for quite a while. I'm speaking with one of the organisers of WSC3 and he is in the middle of nowhere, he informs me, in Scotland, (laughs) even though he's a Canuck and he's an ornithologist, biologist, ecologist. Let's put all those terms together and mishmash mish them all up. But now he's the data guy. Grant Humphreys, how are you? Thanks for being part of the bird emergency. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. It's nice to be here. Now, have I look? One of my special skills is to take technical terms and mash them up and use them incorrectly. Now, is it fair to call you the data guide these days? I I think that's what I've become over the last little while. But that's not where you began. Let's go back to how you became a certified bird nerd and even more extreme, a seabird nut. Oh, God, that goes back a long way. 2009? Um, No, earlier than that. I I actually started uh, birding as a kid. Good. And that was uh, due to my dad's influence. And when I got in my undergrad, about my third year in, I, I took an ornithology course at, at Memorial University. And being a birder, I did really well in the course. And so my professor at the time approached me to go to Alaska for my first field season. And I went there and worked on whiskered offlets, leeches, storm petrels, and a few other species. I came back to Newfoundland and then absolutely fell in love with seabirds. And from there on in, basically, I was hooked. And uh, between my master's and my PhD and uh, two postdocs, I built a skill set around programming, web design, quantitative ecology, and, and that's where I've where I've come now. You're, you're running a, a, con, a consulting firm is probably the, a, a loose description of it, but it's, it's a technology firm rather than a um, bird science firm. And what you do is crunch the data that is available from all kinds of sources and turn it into usable information for decision makers. And it's essentially about about seabirds. So explain your company, Black Borks. Tell us what a black bork is and tell us what <laughs> your business does. So I work full time for a company called uh, High Def Aerial Surveying. And I'm their lead data scientist. So Black Box is actually a side gig for me. Now, Black Box is um, a term in Newfoundland for sooty shearwaters. I remember my grandfather talking about Black Box when I was a kid. And when I decided that I was going to start my own consultancy, I needed to go with that because I work a lot in machine learning. And the kind of running gag is that machine learning... Uh, algorithms are black box so it ended up being a bit of play on words yeah yeah i'm always fascinated by the maps i see where people are putting up the tracking of migrating birds or population density it's really interesting watching the migration from uh to and fro north and south america and the density of birds coming back and forward now you're using that kind of data where does it come from How do you get it? How do you manipulate it to make sense? Yeah, so that's that's probably a a three-hour conversation. (laughs) So there's a variety of data sources. You can do things like track track birds with GPS tags. There's radar work that's being done in places like North America, where you look at migration. You have at-sea surveys, where you sit on a boat for days and days and just count the number of birds that you see as you're out there. Now tell me the if company you, I uh, sorry sorry Grant to interrupt you but if you're doing that kind of work I'm interested do you have a handheld clicker that you go click not while I'm at sea okay but I also do work in Antarctica with a company called Oceanides 
and we count penguins at colonies. And the way we do that is, in fact, with just a clicker. We just sit there, and that's a a fun gig. (laughs) Very cool. So the... Where, where is the information coming from? Let's talk about the satellite tracking data and the radar data. Is that stuff you have to contract to collect or is it is it like NASA or is it the European Space Agency or is it air control, traffic control systems? It, give us an idea of where the data comes from and, and how do you get access to it? So the satellite tracking data, those are come from bespoke devices. So these devices are built by small companies that focus primarily on building tags that can be tracked using GPS satellites. The Those companies then provide interfaces for you to be able to access those data. So you don't actually need to go to NASA or, or ESA or anything like that. You, you access it through either collecting a bird. So you put a tag on a bird, it goes out, comes back, and then you retrieve the device, plug it into your computer, and then pull the GPS tracks from that. Or you get the satellite tags, which actually transmit data to a satellite, and then you download it remote, and there are costs to that. Obviously, the satellite ones tend to be far more but they're getting smaller and they're getting cheaper and uh, more and more people are using them on uh, sort of mid-sized species some of the larger petrels and and shearwaters and certainly an albatross and they're quite a cool way of looking at how birds are moving in space and time in, in near real time and that has the benefit where you don't have to capture the bird again to retrieve the data and, and yeah, I, that's I'm, right. I'm guessing that after a period of time the, the the tag comes to the end of its useful life and will fall off the bird yeah it depends on how it's attached in the past some of the devices used to be sutured onto the birds that that practice is long past so now it generally gets attached to the feathers and those feathers will molt yeah so the devices will fall off at, during the molt so how about, so I think I understand pretty much how the satellite data works with the, the two different collection methods. How about that radar density information? Yeah, so the radar, a lot of that work is focused on large flocks of birds. So you can't identify a bird down to species. No. But you can look at massive flocks as they move across an area. And that comes from things like... Uh, Doppler radar, if you're familiar with that. They're, Doppler they're is the, used for ra- uh, weather, right? They're the white domes, aren't they? The, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And those data come from people who are monitoring weather systems who've noticed big blobs of things moving across moving across uh, sites. You can buy smaller radar devices, but typically people make use of existing radar facilities. And those data then are accessed and for some cost and or in some cases you might have a collaboration with a radar facility now you mentioned that you're working full-time for who was it let me pull it up because i'm uh high def aerial surveying high def aerial surveying now what methods does high def aerial surveying use and let, let's extend it to you don't need to identify who the clients are, but the kind of information that that they get and how do they use it? What is aerial surveying useful for? Yeah, so we have a um, bespoke camera rig that we attach to a manned aircraft, and that aircraft will fly over areas and the camera will take video. And that video then returns to us, and then we identify all of the birds and marine mammals that are in the imagery. And then those data are then processed and geo-referenced. So it means that we assign latitude, longitude for every species or every bird. 
And then those data go to uh, environmental impact assessments or other projects, depending on the nature of the, the work. And we're focused mostly on offshore wind farms. So we do a lot of the pre-consent mon monitoring or the uh, post-consent monitoring. And that's uh, part of the larger legislation here in the UK. And I, uh, the, so there's different ways of collecting the same kind of information. So can, can you layer the aerial data that you're getting from aircraft, which is photographic information, and I want to talk about the machine learning and the identification a bit more if we can. But then you have like the, the Doppler information and then you have satellite information that may be applicable to the same species that you are surveying from the planes at the same time. Are you able to crunch it all the different areas or the, all the different sources together to make something useful or are we not at that point? point yet so in theory yes we could do that but it depends on a lot of things you need a lot of people to be doing a lot of work in the same place at the same the same time and it's really difficult to coordinate that so you can imagine tracking a bunch of birds from a colony if they decide that they're going to go that way <laughs> but, but you're planning your surveys to do go somewhere in here you're going to miss what you were tracking yeah no I, I get that you can't rely on it all being useful together because of birds are individuals and make up their own decisions and, and where they yeah go. that's right but 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 i think you've answered it that we're not quite at the stage where it's easy to get one sort of data set from one method and crunch it together with data set from another method that might coincide in space and time <laughs> graphical location and the and and the time and make it over uh, make it easily overlay so you can understand it is machine learning and artificial intelligence helping to make your work easier so just to go back a back step. a step um there's work being done on merging these different data sets and so the that's advancing pretty quickly and there's already a few papers, certainly in the last couple of years, that have looked at how you might take multiple data sets that have different data collection methods and then merge them together. Um, now, as for machine learning and artificial intelligence, those fields have advanced very rapidly. And every year, you could do something, and then within a few months, it'll be completely obsolete. For us, what we've been looking into is ways of improving the review process. So by applying artificial intelligence to the video imagery, we're aiming to cut back on the amount of time it takes to do the quality assurance process. But it's a long and challenging thing to do. Not only programming the process, but making sure that the data go into it, data going into it are, are clean and annotated. So there's a, there's still a lot of work to do, but more and more we're seeing algorithms and methods that will allow for aerial survey data to be more easily reviewed and analyzed. Now, I can never let an opportunity to put a flippant cliche into a conversation. Garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> the other query I've got about all this massive data that's being collected from different places and particularly the aerial surveys that you guys do, once you've produced your reports and the people who paid for the information have done what they need to do with it, does that ever make it into the public domain for other researchers to use later on? Some of it does. And those are usually the data that are commissioned by government agencies. More and more, a lot of the companies that employ us are allowing the data to be used by other researchers and the like. It just depends on a case-to-case -case basis. And usually the final reports for those projects need to have been accepted at a government level. Yeah. 
so what yeah once the work is once the work is done that the the purpose of collecting that data if it i'm sure it could be relevant to thousands of other people who don't have the don't have the funds to to go out and collect it themselves and in the biodiversity crisis we need all the information we can get don't we yeah that's right and the nice thing about say digital video or digital still from aerial surveys is that you get a um, really massive standardized data set over over not only wide areas but a wide temporal swath. So you can have 24 months of certs, surveys. And that can have a big impact on how you do the analysis, right? Because, and most of us who work in ecology will know that we work with really messy data sets. So having standardized data sets over large areas in time and space can make a huge difference to the quality of the outputs. In aerial surveying, how, what does standardization mean? Let's pretend you're not talking to a scientist. Um, and uh, does that mean that, yeah, tell me how, it is, how, you, how it's standardized at the collection point in aerial surveying? So with aerial surveying, you can fly transects, so lines all across your survey area, at regular intervals. So you can fly them at, say, two, two and a half kilometers apart. Yep. So you get really standardized transects. You also get a really short time a really short time to cover a large area. So you get a more true s- snapshot of a region. Mean, and, and does that mean that different, so different planes with different pilots doing the same area maybe at intervals of four or five days will end up traveling at about the same speed at about the same altitude and going over exactly the same patch of ground and or ocean yeah that's right so we can give them a set height and a set series of lines to fly and they can basically program that into the aircraft and say we're going to fly this straight line and it's amazing actually i have to say the the guys who fly this aircraft will almost fly the exact same gps line every single time it there's some variation if you get a bit of wind yeah so you can imagine flying up wind your aircraft has to crab a bit mm. but broadly speaking they always fly the same transect lines mm. so you get the same transect lines month after month after month and then year and, after um, year after year, yeah, which makes that's right. it valuable yeah, for trends. And it's also repeatable yeah, because it's digital. Yeah. You can go back and revisit it. Yeah. And, well, there's the variables like wind and weather, but, hey, tractors can do it without anyone sitting in the cockpit, so it should be <laughs> able to be done with any other piece of equipment, bearing in mind those, those variables that tractors don't have. <laughs> Now, I think we've determined that what you do is pretty useful, Grant. So let's talk about the World Seabird Conference 3, that you're the you're pulling it, helping to pull it together now that it's a virtual event, which Patrick has told us about, the reasons for that. What do you see as being the main benefit, the, the use of everyone coming together every five years? And, and let's, it used to be hanging out. This year it's different. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard thing to not be able to be there in person. Obviously, we've got many regional seabird conferences. So there's the Pacific Seabird Group Conference. The Seabird Group has a conference. Australasian Seabird Group gets together every so often. So there's uh, all these regional conferences. But until the World Seabird Conference came along, there wasn't really a big conference to bring us all together. We, in the past, we've, we've always had com- communication with other people from other countries and that sort of stuff, but we were never able to really get together. So this time around, it's quite challenging in the sense that we're not going to be able to see our colleagues and friends that we haven't, haven't been with in a long time. So the nice thing about this virtual conference is that as 
we can still be together socially without having to travel. And obviously travel is a very challenging thing at the moment, not the least with regards to say quarantine times. So if you wanted to go somewhere, you end up having to quarantine for 10 days. So this is the best we can do in a bad situation. And apart from the, the fact that we, we can't all get together, because we're not all together, we've got to deal with all different time zones. So how challenging is that for you as an organiser of a virtual event? Yeah, I'll say Rob will probably have more to say about that because he would have had a monumental challenge trying to put together a scientific program around multiple time zones. The social events were a little bit different. There are, We tried to make attempts to ensure that there were social events in every appropriate time zone. And what we decided to do was to basically split the world in half. So we have the Australasian side of the world and then the sort of North Atlantic or the Atlantic side of the world. And we realized that there are some people that are not going to get the benefit of that, but we had to do what we could in order to make sure that we could actually coordinate something. Because just doing across those those two orange slices was challenging enough. So you can imagine the more you slice up the world, the more challenging it gets. And we didn't want to get into a situation where we had to multiply how many times people are doing things, right? I think we both understand this. You scheduled the time for this, for our discussion. And the only way that you can make that kind of thing work like I do regularly, is I just have to say, you just pick a time that works for you. If I have to get up at 4 a.m., I'll get up at 4 a.m. That's okay. Drink lots of coffee. Because, well, because the conversation or whatever is important enough to do that. And that's how you need to have the attitude, I think, with anything like this, a global event. Somebody's getting up in the middle of the night. That's And somebody's going to have to have organised someone else to look after the kids at the end of school that someone else is going to have to do school pick up or drop off that's just the way these things are and it's only a once in a once every five years it's good good yeah. to do so we learned some lessons from uh, the twitter conference that we do every year and the twitter conference is global so we've really tried to work orange slices into how we think about the twitter conference and uh, we brought that forward into uh, what we're doing for the World Seabird Conference. Okay, let's do a bit of a plug for the World Seabird Conference. If somebody's listening and they think, oh, that sounds pretty interesting, I'll, I might like to get involved in that. How, how do they do it? What, if they want to be involved in the social aspect of the conference, what have you got to offer and how can they get involved? So the, the conference is being run through a platform called Underline. And Underline integrates with another platform called GatherTown. And GatherTown is a uh, virtual environment where you have an avatar. And that avatar walks around like in a video game. Oh, if you, if it, anyone it... out there has ever played um, uh, Pokemon, it's like that. You've got a little avatar you walk around. And you can interact with other people. Oh, so we, as you approach people in the environment, you can you can communicate with them. Are we talking um, the Sims? Sorry, go ahead. Is this like the Sims? No, it's not not as advanced as that. Okay. This is literally just you have a little character yeah. on a map, and you walk around. It's got your name affixed to it. And as you approach people, your camera and microphone turn on, and you link to them. So you can interact just like you were at a conference. There's also like a games room. So we'll, we'll have a game room set up where you can go in and play games like uh, Pictionary or Draw Battle is what they call it on there. And they're really good ways for people to just sit down, maybe have a couple of drinks if they're in the right time zone, catch up, laugh, carry on. We also have things like a trivia night. So we'll have two trivia events where people will be split up in teams and there'll be several trivia questions asked and 
all that sort of stuff. Should be good fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got a scavenger hunt as well. So that's like a one-time thing where you'll have to run around your house like a crazy person and uh, try to find seabird-related items around your I don't want to think about some people's houses. <laughs> How many people are you expecting to be involved, Grant? So at the moment, I think we're about 600 people, give or take, who will be at the conference. As for who will be involved in the social events, hard to say. It depends on how burned, pe- burned out people are. Oh, the hardcore there. <laughs> Seabed, Ned. That, yeah. 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 I, look, I'll ask you at the end, afterwards, not at the end, at, after the conference, to confirm my suspicions about some of those who will be hardcore involvees. When, when I spoke to Patrick, we didn't talk about the process of enrolling as an attendee who can come what kind of costs are involved for somebody if they're like me thinking gee seabird trivia and scavenger hunt (laughs) sounds pretty good because it might surprise you to know grant that i don't actually have a seabird paper to present not a single one not a single one the conference registration is 150 usd and that gives you access to everything on the other line system yeah, there's no separate fee if you just want to join in with the social event. Those people would be a pain in the neck. Yeah, <laughs> that would be, be too like many me. of those. That would be people like <laughs> me. <laughs> but yeah, so the the conference itself, once you pay for the registration, you get access to the underlying system. So all the talks, workshops, games, trivia, all that sort of stuff. But you also get access to the recordings, so that all the talks are recorded. And you'll have access to those for however many billions of years. And now you're one of the organisers, so I did ask Patrick about this, but he skirted the question. Are you aware of anything that's going to be presented that is going to change the world? That's a tough question. I I got to say, change the seabird world. Yeah, I I I will say that every bit of seabird research that's presented at these conferences plays a role in changing the world. It's all valuable. And that's right. It's all small cogs in a larger machine. That's right. It all, it all feeds the beast. Um, and that's we're right. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, exactly. We always like to get that cliche in because we need to remember that every paper you read is building on something that somebody else did. I can see in the background of your office, you've got that beautiful 12 string guitar there. Yeah, my thinking guitar. Now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how talented you think you are. You have, nobody has written a new song in the last 40 <laughs> years. It's all been done before. It's uh, all the same four chords. That's right. Three, three chords and the truth, man. Look, I have to ask. Can you play any of the birds songs on your 12 string? No, I cannot play any songs by the birds. There's a challenge for you. I thought that was going to be logical there with the 12 string guitar. And most of my songs are uh, Irish Newfoundland music. Is, is that like Morris dancing uh, accompanying that kind of stuff? Yeah, to a degree. Oh, very good. Very good. Immersing yourself in, in your culture and meshing meshing your Scottish residency with your Newfoundland heritage. I like that yeah. very much. You're not wearing a kilt. No, I would never wear a kilt. <laughs> I'm a Newfoundlander, not a uh, Scotsman. Okay, from someone who knows very little about Newfound- Newfoundland except that it's in Canada and it's on the coast. East um, Coast. Yes, it's on the coast and that there's a big dog named after it. What a new fan, what a new founders, Newfoundland does known for new, Newfoundlanders. Newfoundlanders, you gotta say, you gotta say it. it's Newfoundland, yes, Newfoundlanders. Okay, what are you known for? Oh, goodness, fishing, fishing is a big one. Huge populations of seabirds, we got massive colonies of myrrh, puffins, storm petrels, and the like. In the Music old- is a big one. In the olden Music is days, definitely a big one. In the olden days, did you used to eat shearwaters like like we did here in, in Australia, the old mutton bird, the wedge-tailed shearwater? 
So interestingly, in Newfoundland, there's still a commercial hunt for myrrh. We call it tur. So we say we're going for the tur hunt, and that's still a commercial harvest. Back in the olden days, I'm, no, I say the olden days, but yeah. my grandfather used to tell me stories of uh, shooting shearwaters at sea and taking them in and cooking them up. That doesn't happen so much anymore. But certainly myrrh, just two summers ago, I went home and had a feast of tur with the family are they are they good i, I could I... if you if you had mutton bird you, you can probably make an egg make a guess i've had i've had canned mutton bird and i can tell you i wouldn't have wasted the <laughs> energy to do it and the meat is the byproduct of the oil for the in yeah. industry here that's why they wanted the birds for the oil <laughs> not for their beautiful tasty flesh yeah i don't uh quite know why Newfoundlanders still do it. I don't find it amazingly tasty. I like it because I grew up with it, but there's better meat out there. Well, it's like the old joke uh, about galah stew or the galah casserole. Yeah. Put a galah, four cups of vegetables and four rocks in a pot, cook for three hours, strain off and eat the rock. So, Not far off. Not yeah, far off. Yeah, yeah. So after the conference, what what happens? Everything gets presented, all the papers are presented, and then what do you do for the next five years? The um, question of the day, isn't it? With most conferences, there's usually a lot of excitement almost immediately after. And so everyone will go about doing a bunch of really interesting things, building collaborations. And it typically gets a bit quiet after that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're hoping that after this conference, we'll see a lot of push towards some really interesting and um, innovative uses of new technologies, not just say video conferencing technologies, but machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm sure that people will come away from it with some new ideas on how to analyze their data. And that typically happens at most conferences. We're really hoping to bring people together in a way that allows them to foster new collaboration. I asked the question, because I've been in, in previous life to lots of different kinds of industry conferences and whatnot, and you do get that excitement and there's some momentum straight after an event. So I'm wondering, can you think of Anything that, and I don't mean that nothing has come from conferences, but have there been any significant developments that have come about straight after WSC 1 or 2? Has there been a new group formed or new coll collaborations with significant institutions that were driven because of the, the Seabird Conference? So I would say that one of the big things that happened after, say, the wor first World Seabird Conference was um, seabirds.net and uh, some of the databases. So those were what were called legacy projects. And seabirds.net has um, been a bit of a central point for communication and uh, building collaboration with other scientists. There's been a message board and stuff like that set up several initiatives like the seabird information network which is a series of databases and, the and i just pulled that up on uh, that's why i'm not not looking at you at the moment is that an example of what i was talking about those data sets that existed and were being used by institutions or for other purposes and then they've been put together and opened up to the wider world to use so on the seabird information network you'll find a list of existing databases and uh, those databases would be examples of that um, you would find uh, certain ones on there that have been commissioned by government organizations and those ones are all open access and you might have some there that come from university groups and most of those if not all of them are completely open access the big one or one of the biggest ones is the seabirdtracking.org um, database which is run by BirdLife and that one is just a massive collection of uh, seabird tracking data 
Christy, where have I, where has this been all my life? I was aware <laughs> right in front of you now. I was aware of about half of these. Everybody, if you're listening, seabirds.net and Seabird Information Network, amazing stuff. This is why I really like talking seabirds is because I've used the term fanatics and nuts a few times where I'm talking about all of you seabird academics. Uh, you're so active and so connected and sharing all of this information enables people like me who stand outside your world to jump in and really learn so much and there's so much information out there that it's really easy to get lost in in the noise as we mentioned before you've got to have clean data so th this is great so wsc1 kicked off this what about wsc2 so wsc2 and the lead up to wsc2 brought about the twitter conference so the World Seabird Twitter Conference, and I would argue that the Twitter Conference and Twitter, I should say in general, has really been a major driving force in the like interconnectivity that's developed in the Seabird community. People started congregated there after the first Twitter Conference, and it's just expanded year after year. And more and more people are getting involved and communicating on Twitter and sharing the research. And that was came about just prior to the second World Seabird Conference. But during the C second Seabird Talk, the second World Seabird Conference, the decision was made to continue uh, doing the Twitter conferences because they were so successful. There were also there were some collaborations, and certainly I made a lot of really good friends at that second conference, who I still work with today. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who's got a story like that. Yeah, Twitter gets so much hate from the general community about it being a toxic place and whatnot. But bird Twitter is just a, a great place. I yeah. love it. Yeah, it's totally different when you're in the political community. The politics behind it are pretty rough. But in the seabird community and in the bird community in general, a lot of the stuff is quite positive. Yeah, it's helped develop some interesting uh, collaborations. There's been a few papers that I've been involved in, and some of my colleagues have been involved in just writing about Twitter as a communication tool. And I think that for a long time, people underestimated it, oh, and yeah. it's now become a, a real central point to communicating seabird science. Yeah, I think even in citizen science, I think it's the I think it's the essential tool if you want to reach beyond the academic com community because you've got the possibility of being found on Twitter whereas some platforms are just too big and and that you have to play a ridiculous game to get seen whereas once you get found in Twitter, then people will find your other socials. But if you're trying to use the other socials as your discovery platform, it's just too difficult. Um, yeah. We don't have the time or the money to, to do it, <laughs> I, I think, in, in, in general. Grant, I, I haven't uh, sort of prepared you for any hard questions, but what you've been involved in so many different kind of projects. Can you pick, pick out one or maybe two that has been... Perhaps your favourite for any kind of reason that you've been involved in. And perhaps what do you regard as being the most significant in terms of the data manipulation or the data presentation? So I would say that the project that has most influenced my life and has been the work that I did in Stony Brook New York that got me involved in Antarctica as a sort of spin-off of that. I've been going to the CAMLAR meetings every year and CAMLAR is the uh, organization that is um, in charge of managing Antarctic marine living resources, uh, fishing and the like. And so that's come off as the, of that project. But more importantly was that project really is what 
pointed me towards consultancy work because that project was focused on building a, a, a web tool and a database that people could access. And if you go to uh, penguinmap.com, that's the uh, website that I developed. And uh, that database is used by managers and scientists um, around the world. And there has been a huge number of papers that have used the database. So I have to say that's probably one that I'm incredibly proud of. And that website is actually being updated at the moment as part of another contract. And we'll have a shinier interface and all that sort of stuff. That project also made me realize that I was more than just a seabird ecologist and that I was more of a data scientist because I was using data from a, a system that I was unfamiliar with, Antarctica, to derive a product that, that people could use immediately. My personal issues with, say, the publishing system as it is right now is that we focus too much on this publisher parish attitude and being able to demonstrate that scientists can develop useful tools has been eye-opening for me. So rather than focusing on just publishing papers, um, we can develop tools rapidly that are useful for management decisions that go beyond just writing papers. I really agree with that. As someone who is not affiliated with any academic institution, if publish or perish is the guiding principle of of survival and and your worth as a as an academic and a researcher then you are of absolutely no worth to the community the wider community if i can't read your bloody paper so <laughs> if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to there to hear it that's the most annoying thing that there is obviously valuable work going on Nobody, apart from the anointed few, can read the bloody things because somebody wants you to pay 150 bucks to, yeah. to register to read something that you might only want once. This, this, there's a real disconnect between communication and research that some people have really successfully conquered and they are doing really well, but some institutions and the curmudgeons and the troglodytes who are in charge of them, the gatekeepers, just don't have any idea about that the world has moved beyond that model. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's it's a real shame because there is a lot of really good science uh, going on out there, but it's not being communicated because it's either A, behind a paywall, or B, is not politically interesting it's not a hot topic or, or right. is politically damaging that, too damaging i find that very common with a lot of government affiliated bodies like zoos and whatnot who won't talk about stuff they're doing because if it's not successful if they're doing if they're having a program that's in a trial or experimental phase and if it's not successful they can't go out and do the lovely photo shoot and invite the like lo the local yeah. media but We've got to be honest in, in, in conservation that some stuff doesn't work and you need to talk about that too so that someone else on the other side of the world doesn't trot out and waste two years doing something you yeah. already know doesn't work. Yeah, so that's a really good point, actually. When you look through the scientific literature, I would say 95 to 99% of it is about your successes. Absolutely. And the failures are completely missed. And the, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that what you just said is that you go out and you do a, re, you do a bit of research that somebody else has already done it and known that, knows that it doesn't work. But the other side of that is around the mental health of PhD or postdocs who come out on the other side and may have had a pile of failures and feel like they need to be succeeding all the time. And if they don't get three to five papers out in the run of a year, then you failed as a scientist. I and because of all these successes, I think that it 
has a great impact, a negative impact, on, on people's mental health. Something that I always try and do, Grant, is to present what the real work is behind the papers. And so much of it is just grunt work, repetitive grunt work that you go out day after day with your clicker and you do, 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 or you tick, tick. The exciting, the glamorous, for want of a much better term, but stuff of presenting your paper and everything is but a fraction of the actual undertaking of graduate, undergraduate work, postgrad. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought about it in terms of the mental health applications before, but the idea that everything is a success and everything is landmark and whatnot, it's not. These little, you know, they're building blocks, they're, pe they're pebbles, they're grains of sand on a beach, but they're all still important and they make up the the landscape and I hope researchers especially undergrads and, and PhD candidates and whatnot understand that there are people in the community who know that you are basically working for nothing that you are sat you would be yeah. doing much better if you were in, working as an intern in an office in terms of cr climbing the ladder getting your house getting a nice car but you're not doing that because the work you're doing is important for other reasons, and that, yeah. and that there are there is a whole world of people who understand that and uh, want to pat you on the back day after day for doing the work. So, yeah, if you're listening and you and you're one of those people, don't get discouraged and don't. It, of all the projects out there, only one of them is going to get noticed by the mainstream media. One out of maybe ten thousand. So, yeah, that's right. We can't, um, we can't all win American Idol. That's it. And we can't all be uh, mega productive. Exactly. But there are researchers out there who are incredibly prolific. They can pump out five to ten papers a year or more without piles of problems in the sense that they're able to do it because they've got some advantage. Or, or that what they do is they basically do a slightly different variation of the work they've already done yeah. and found yeah. somewhere else to accept this paper. So what they're really doing is producing 10 chapters of one book and pretending it's 10 books. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. I see that a lot. And look, hey, yeah. th that's fine. If someone, if some journal wants to publish it, good luck to you. But it... Yeah. But it's not how people should be being judged or being uh, – judged is a bad word. They are being evaluated. Yeah. You know, it's all – This is it. It comes back, comes back to that publisher perish attitude, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and the question is, should you have 10 small pokey papers that kind of all tie together? Or do you have one really big, beautiful piece of work that represents 10 years of work? Oh. And unfortunately, at the moment, we prioritize the former of those two. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw something else that might be a bit controversial into the ring, Grant. Oh, boy. What if I've published five landmark papers about conservation actions, initiatives that need to occur? Right? They're critical. They need to occur. Every, everyone is saying, yes, yes, you've unlocked the secret and then nothing bloody happens. Mm -hmm. How successful have you really been? Yeah, that's that's a challenge that's often faced at places like CAMLAR, International Whaling Commission. All these large organizations that are involved with massive conservation projects always fight trying to bridge science and politics. Yeah. Politics are so emotionally driven that it's really challenging to bring science into that sphere effectively. I like to take it back a, back a step. I like to think of the smaller projects. So let's think, Australia is a really good example where we've got an extinction crisis with our small mammals and, and lots of birds on the edge at the moment. And we all know you've got to exclude predators and you've got to protect habitat. All right, blah, blah, blah. We all know that. We're all out there saying that. All right. 
The next step is the important thing, making that happen on a small scale and a medium scale. And we fund the data collection and the analysis and the publication, but then we don't fund the fence. Yeah. So that's where people, and it's not on, it's not on academics to make this happen, but we all need to understand the problem and then work to get that next part. What's the point of getting a million dollars of funding to find a solution to a problem and then not spending $200,000 to solve the problem? That's yeah. what drives me bonkers in all this stuff, that people are really good at collecting money for research and really crap at getting money to get things done. Yeah, there's a fundamental disconnect between uh, political action and political will and, uh, and scientific integrity and scientific research. And that's something that kind of needs to change at a government level. The government needs to provide funding that not only funds the research, but then funds the actions to follow up the research. I think institutions and individual researchers have a part to play in this in that when they're applying for funding, they need to be, they need to be continually pushing to include some of the amelioration or mitigation measures as part of the initial project? Yeah, so I don't disagree in the sense that... And I don't... Yeah. So it's... I think about a lot of the problem is within the university system, you're expected to do your research, then move on to your next project. Yeah. Ha hand, right? hand it over and then shut up. That's yeah. what you're expected to do. You yeah, move on exactly. to the next project. But, but right. yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Master. You've given me a million dollars to, to, to do the research yeah. project. And then the Master is saying, thank you very much. It's a very nice paper. Put it over there. I'll read it later. Now go away. Yeah. I have an important it, meeting to attend. <laughs> and it comes back to, like, universities being run as businesses, Yep. right? They don't fall into this the the sphere of uh, steady state eco economics you and know, they're, they're and, interested in growth and they're dependent even even though they are set up to run on business models they are dependent on the largesse of the state to exist because they get grants they still call it business income but the government gives just about every university the money it needs to actually survive and then if a successful business univer university using a business model then goes out to get the cream. But to actually exist, it still all comes from government money. To, however way you divvy it up, student grants or whatever, it's still coming out of the taxpayer's purse and you're depending on the largesse of the political masters. So you can't upset yeah. anybody. That's why the model's yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and the, any public money that goes into a research program should automatically mean that research program or the findings of the research program should be public. Yep. Should, should be, public. be publicly accessible. And, and I, I take it a step further. If it was important enough to spend a million dollars to find out what the problem is and say it costs a fraction of that million dollars to ameliorate some of the problem, why isn't it important enough to spend that money? If it was important enough to find out that you hit your foot with a hammer, is it important to fix your broken toe? Yeah. It, it, it just seems dumb. And, yeah, and some of, the, um, some of the work that's being done offshore, looking at predator eradication, but predator eradication on offshore islands, those are relatively expensive programs, not only for the research, but those are probably examples of where it has succeeded because the research has been done and they've shown that there's some predator that's wiping out some population of seabirds and then they've gone in and eradicated them. One of the most successful ones and probably more expensive ones were uh, the rat eradications on South Georgia. Yeah, and Macquarie um, was similar to... And Macquarie was yeah. similar, yeah. But remote areas where you had to get a ship, helicopters, and you had to plan out your poison drops and um, 
absolute massive undertaking. Yep. All driven from some very basic research. Yep. I always go back to the smaller kind of projects that are there. Okay, we've got a colony of burrowing animals that needs to be saved, and it's on this th this three hectare pl plot of land. But we need to exclude foxes and cats. Okay, so we do five kilometres of fencing, and then we want to extend it out. Then we do 10 kilometres, and then after that we do 20 kilometres. They're bite-sized chunks, and they can be done, but they're always from a different funding pool, and it's always competing against tree planting projects and this, that, and this, that, and the other. But I, I think there's plenty of money out there. It's just not being allocated to what we want it to be allocated yeah. for. It's going to supporting, to, to building football stadiums. And it's going to all this stuff that we do we need. Yeah, we need. But it's all about priorities and it's all about the pressure that we get, that that governments get. It's the obvious answer to these questions. But I just get, I just get frustrated where nobody wants to do any conservation work unless they can get a grant why is it a grant why isn't it ongoing funding for projects like this what are departments of conservation or environment for if you can yeah. subsidize a logging company why can't you subsidize a team of 10 uh, a, a perpetual team of grad of grads or something to do practical conservation work it never yeah. ever works yeah. that way no you're right and it's it does come down to political will and it is a funny thing, like a lot of the work that ecologists do is focused on trying to ensure that we don't drive ourselves to extinction. Hmm. You think that that's a relatively important thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's not prioritized uh, by a good number of governments. And even the ones that do say they prioritize it, you still have to apply for your own like research funding you could be a government employee who has to do x y and z it might be managing a national park or something but if you want to do any research and try to come up with a solution to a problem you need to apply for internal grant funding and and while you're doing that you're probably reapplying for your own job every three years so you're spending <laughs> so you're spending yeah. six months evaluating your previous two years worth of work trying to convince someone to re-employ you while you're trying to get funding for a project that might never happen if you don't get re-employed. The, the system's bonkers. It, yeah. It, it, it's nuts. Yeah. It, you've got to have constant evaluation to, to make sure things are working and that people are working and things like that. But these rolling short-term contracts are they kill productivity they don't add to well, they do not only are they in terms of the amount of time it takes for people to go through the process of reapplying but it's terrible for their mental health yep I mean, people's mental health is absolutely failing left and center because of things like this university researchers who have loads of papers and are still on rolling contracts it doesn't make any sense so that so there you are, kids. Please uh, look forward to a to a rewarding job in ecology <laughs> and conservation. <laughs> you do it because you love it. That's well. That's right. We uh, we do. That's why I'm obviously chasing the big bucks, producing a, a podcast about bird conservation. Ah, uh, look. Let, let let's move away from that. I I think we can go into the second part of the show, Grant, where we talk more about Grant. So. Let, let's start with the with the one about where are you on the spectrum? Are you still keeping a list as a birder? I will keep a list until the day I die. However, I wouldn't say that I am a hardcore twitcher. I won't drive 100 miles to go see a bird that showed up from North America or something. However, if I'm traveling and I see a species that I've never seen before, I will tick it off. Do you have a backyard list for Scotland and your historical backyard list for uh, Newfoundland? And are you keeping a water birds list and a seabirds list? And, no, I just uh, have, a, I have a global list. A life list. Very yeah. good. Very good. Now, 
This is always a good one to determine where you are on the spectrum. What's your number on your life list? 1347. You're pretty far along the spectrum, buddy boy. (laughs) Well done. Well done. Now, working in so many locations, you're probably going to have to give a couple of answers for this. But Uh what's your field guide of choice? Ooh, that's a good one. So for seabirds, I wonder if I've got it up behind me. I do, yeah. It's the only in Schofield, albatross and petrels of the world. Very good. That's uh, that's one of my favorite ones. For North Americans, I've got the National Geographic bird guide. And some people really uh, poo-poo that for some reason. (laughs) But I really like it. It's got really beautiful pictures, really shows all the diagnostic features of most species with like really nice photos, good explanations of their range, breeding habitat, and, and the like. So I actually really like that one. And then operating in the UK? Collins, Collins Field Guide. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. And have you moved over to apps apart uh, away from hard copies? So I've got, I've got Merlin. I've got the Merlin ID guide on my phone. I don't use it very often. I don't know. I Sometimes if I catch a glance of something and I only catch like a quick diagnostic feature, I might whip it open and just have a quick look. Or if I'm like in the car and I don't have a bird guide with me, I'll, I'll open it up. But not very often. Now, I might be displaying my, my ignorance here, but because you're the data guy, tech head, on the cutting edge... I've got an app that I can take a photo of just about any plant or I can use my Uh phone and it'll tell me what it is. How far away are we from having something like that in the bird world? So I'm quite sure that there is something like that. I think um, either iNaturalist or some derivation of iNaturalist allows you to do that. Gee, I would love it if it could do any bird. That that <laughs> takes away, but that kind of takes away the romance and the thrill of the. It does, yeah. I, I I'll admit, if if there was an app that would identify a bird for me, I probably wouldn't use it. Yeah, it takes away the the fun the, of like looking through a book and trying to figure out what I saw. But does the eyebrow actually extend that far yeah. back? Yeah, no, I, I'm a bit like you. I used to love lying on the floor with my bird books and trying to nut things out. That was good. Now. <laughs> Everybody knows you need binoculars when you're out doing your bird watching. But what's your essential piece of kit? It can be anything, but what can you not leave home without if you're going out to do some field work or some just recreational twitching? Oh, it's I used to always carry a camera. I used to carry an SLR. I've since since stopped doing that about three or four years. So now I always have my Nikon Monarchs. And that's basically it. Sometimes, sometimes I'll have my uh, my bird book with me, but aside from that, yeah, it's just binoculars. And are, are, are you old school? Are, are you taking a notebook, or if you want to record some field ob- observations, are you just tapping them into the phone or dictating a note? If I see something totally unusual, I'll just tell my wife, and she remembers <laughs> everything for me. <laughs> Very good. Have you got a backup, though, for that system? Back up to my wife. She might get angry if I came up with something else. Well, I mean, that data is only stored in one place, Greg. Yeah. If I'm in the field, like doing field work, especially when I go to Antarctica, I usually have a the rain notebook just in case I see something while I'm down there. We do have, like, data sheets that we're constantly filling out because we do at-sea surveys while we're on the ship as well. And on land, like, we like, make notes of everything. And, click, and the click. clicker. I think on my YouTube channel, I've got a, a 360 video of me clicking penguins and then them surrounding me because they were a bunch of young ones who were wondering what the hell I was doing. Well, that's the appropriate time to give out the YouTube channel name so that people can find it. I'm not sure if I've, I've got one. I think it's, I think you just look for me on YouTube. Okay, It might I'll, be just G Humphreys. Yeah, I'll find the link for people to, to, to chase <laughs> up. That's okay. Again, this might be a hard one for you, Grant. You've been in so many places, so many great locations, but what's your favorite bird? That is, that's a really hard one. I'm going to say 
that it's probably leeches storm petrel because they're the bird that got me into seabirds. A close second would probably be sooty shearwater, a species that I'm quite familiar with. Did my PhD on them and then grew up with them around Newfoundland, of course. Whew. No penguins. I would say that's, that's funny. That's I love good. penguins. I do love penguins, but and, and everybody gives me penguin stuff. Like my kids have so much penguin stuff. You're the penguin guy. Uh, You're the data yeah, guy and the penguin right. guy. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. I've, I've got 20 different hats I wear. <laughs> it just depends on which group I'm hanging out with. <laughs> if I'm hanging out with the penguin people, I'm either a data guy or just one of those other seabird people. Yeah. When I'm with the seabird people, yeah, the penguin I'm a data guy. Oh, just extending your 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 favorite there. Why is leeches the best storm petrel? I don't think I've got a good answer for that. <laughs> I think they're I think they're just great. Yeah, I love them. I think they're uh, lovely to handle. I love the smell. I'm just saying I got um, quite accustomed to the smell working with them. Just I had a pair of gloves for years that smelled like storm petrol, even well after I stopped working with them. Now, someone who's um, never handled a storm petrol, are they prone to vomiting when you handle oh, them? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they're, yeah. so they're, they're pretty normal. Orange, oily puke. Yeah, pretty, nor pretty normal seabirds then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the way they dangle their feet as they're, as they're flying around. That's very cool. Okay, favourite place to go birding? Favourite place to go birding? South Georgia? I'd say. Yeah, South Georgia for sure. It's a spectacular place. Not only is it like amazing scenery, but the biodiversity around South Georgia is stunning. Huge numbers of uh, albatross, petrels, storm petrels, penguins all over the place. Yeah, it, it's just mental. And then, of course, the South Georgia pipit, which is uh, the southernmost passer in the world. Yeah. Very yeah, absolutely amazing place. I did also, of course, really enjoy Costa Rica. I spent some time there, and biodiversity in Costa Rica is just mind-bending. Off the charts. Um, yeah. I just want to extend the South Georgia discussion a little bit because I've got a, got a show called The Bird Emergency, and sometimes I feel like a harbinger of doom. But <laughs> you, you've been down there how many times? So I've been to South Georgia four times now i've yeah. been to antarctica six times okay now of course this is going to be anecdotal but in your view are, are the populations of birds diminishing rapidly in south georgia and let's talk about antarctica as well i would say in south georgia the numbers of birds are generally increasing with the exception of say the albatross not noticeably in the a few times I've been down, okay. but Good. I do know people who have been going down for a long time and they have said that population has certainly decreased. But with regards to say penguins, certainly king penguins are doing fine now compared to what they used to. Their populations have been increasing. Huge numbers of prions and large numbers of petrels as well. There's still obviously lots of threats around South Georgia, but I would say South Georgia, and certainly South Georgia pipit is the other one that's been increasing since the rat eradications. So that, that so it's easy to connect the two there. But do you think with the seabirds that it's maybe fisheries management that's making a, a huge difference? Could be. South Georgia does have a toothfish fishery, and there is certainly some bycatch around there. But there's not piles of fishing around South Georgia. So it's, it's not the same sort of amount as you would get around say Argentina or even Portugal, Spain, up around the UK, completely different in terms of the amount of fishing. Anecdotal, we can't really take that much yeah. further, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hope that I'm not going to be, be forever a harbinger of doom. So we know your favorite place. So where's, what's your bucket list location? I would say for burning, it would be Columbia. I would, I would love to do some birding in Colombia. Not that I'm like a warm weather person. I really hate warm weather and tropics. Not my thing at all. But uh, the bird 
biodiversity in Colombia is mind bending <laughs> and we're birding for there, but I do really want to get to Siberia sometime and get up to the Arctic, uh, Russian Arctic islands. And check out the cool, the curlew's breeding grounds, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Spoonbill sandpiper. That's definitely one I'd like to find one day. Yeah. I hope they're, I hope they're around. Yeah. <laughs> no, not much longer left on those guys. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> something will happen and that they'll hang on. So what's your bucket list bird? Is it the Spoonie? Spoonie is, yeah. Yeah. that would be it. The other one that I'd like to see in the world would be a sec- secretary bird. Oh, secretary bird. They're amazing. They're, they're kind of like the shoebill stork. You, you, they're, they're just too too insane in to to even be real. But they're real. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. You've successfully negotiated the bird emergency questions, Grant. Well done. Grant. No particular surprises there, except that you're not the penguin. You're not really the penguin, dude. There, it, it just depends. Like I said, it, it depends on the group I'm in. Sometimes I'll be the penguin guy. Sometimes I'll be the data guy. Sometimes I'll be the seabird guy. Sometimes I'll be the token Newfoundlander. The, the token Canadian. Yeah. That, that wouldn't really be a thing, though, would it? That, that, that could only be in groups of Americans, wouldn't it? I, I would say I'm the token Canadian up here. Oh, but does anyone? Few even, of us, but but nobody even thinks like that. I mean, I, I'm here. I'm I'm a colonial as well, and we're, I would never think. Uh, oh, there's one Canadian in the group. He's the Canadian. He's the token Canadian. We wouldn't even think that. You're just one of the gang. You're just one of I, the po- post-colonial refugees. I think it's it's funny because it's most of the time it's people going over to North America, not North Americans coming over here. Yeah, but Scotland's pretty amazing, isn't it? I love it. And, yeah, and it's a beautiful place. And you're way up north, aren't you, in Scotland? Yeah, I'm just about seven miles south of Loch Ness. Seven miles south of Loch Ness. So, yeah. How, how is how's the seabirding on your patch? Around my house is not particularly good. No, but in, <laughs> but in your region, yeah, no, it's great. There's some amazing seabird colonies in Scotland. Have you got some puffins? bass rock. Oh yeah, puffins. Yeah. Certainly, there's loads of puffin colonies. There's some really amazing ferry trips you can take from the west coast to like the Outer Hebrides. Yeah, and there's always loads of birds, divers, which loons, cormorants, and shags, puffins, myrrh. The whole nine yards, right? Loads of gannets. So let so let's talk anecdotal again. How are the numbers holding up in in your patch in Scotland? Depends on the species. Um, some species are doing quite poorly. Kittywake, for example, big one that's uh, just getting clobbered around here. Puffin numbers and myrrh numbers seem to be declining, but not as rapidly. Whereas uh, gannets seem to be stable or increasing and in, a lot of that depends on colony and and that sort of stuff but uh, broadly speaking the one of the worst ones off is the uh, kitty wake i have to talk about the kitty wake in uh, in detail at, at some stage it seems crazy that a seagull would be struggling <laughs> <laughs> for those of us who live in live in the coastal fringe of australia particularly hard to imagine any seagull would be having a hard time it's a funny thing yeah they're Quite a unique species in the in amongst the larids. There we go. You go all scientist on me. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I, I would never be caught dead <laughs> calling them seagulls. No, well, that's right. That's because you're the smart scientist, Grant. I'm just that <laughs> other dude. I hope we can um, catch up, maybe, and and you can tell me how successful WSC three was after the event. But, yeah, uh, we can hope. But people, please, uh, please do go and go and enrol if you are a seabird person or an ornithology person with an interest in seabirds. Uh, get into it, Grant. Where can people chase up you if they would like to find out more about your work? You can track me down pretty easily if you uh, Google Grant Humphrey Seabirds. Usually my profile on seabirds.net. 
that's will exact- come up with my email address. That's exactly the Google search I did. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that worked. It, it did. It came, up, <laughs> came up with a whole pile of stuff. What Twitter handle should people be looking out for? I have the incredibly original Twitter handle of at Grant Humphreys. <laughs> well, you were very, you must have been a very early adopter to get that. I think so. I think I was one of the, or probably the only, or Grant Humphreys at the time, Twitter. Now, I reference this far too often, but what's the best Twitter handle you've ever seen, Grant? Oh, my God. That's a... Uh... Oh, I would have thought that would be an easy one for you. Has to be Steph Burrell's, doesn't it? Well, Steph's is good. Yeah. Steph's is good, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think I have a favorite. I'm gonna, you know what? Ask me that question next time we talk. Okay, I'm you'll, gonna, you'll, I'm gonna look around you, and gonna, I'll, uh, I'll have a real think about it. All right. If, as a seabird guy, you can find a better one than petrol station, you let me know. Yeah, you know? I will. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks again, Grant. The bird emergency doing seabirds for WSC three. Everyone, get involved. Do whatever you can. Remember, you can't do everything. Just do something. Thanks a bunch, Grant. I'm Grant Williams. See you later.